Well, hello, church. If you'd open to uh, Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Um, Kent read that very long passage, so I would not have to right now and then preach on top of that. Uh, but let me give us a summary verse of that whole chapter. I think the best summation is Luke 14, 11. You don't have to turn there. I can read this for us. Jesus said, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray. Father, we know that's a promise and we know that will happen. We pray it would happen in everyone's life in this room before we stand before You. We pray for a willing humbling of ourselves. Do it through Your Word. As Brother Tim just prayed, do it by Your Spirit. That's our hope. And so we just ask You to come, Holy Spirit, and work in our hearts. And we ask that Your Word be clear. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Daniel chapter 4 uh, is about pride, and um, pride is a very uh, obvious thing sometimes, and it's a very subtle thing, and uh, the obvious form uh, I got a, a, a write-up close look at uh, a few years back in the gym, uh, there was a man that came up to me, and uh, he, he was uh, working out. And he said, hey man, look at this, 350 pounds on the bench press. And um, he said, guess how old I am? I don't know, sir. He said, I'm 80 years old. And um, I'm lifting more than I did when I was 20. And I'm like, well, that's good. Um, <laughs> I mean, what do you say? Uh <laughs> But here, here's what actually I said. The Lord gave me a, a streak of boldness in that moment. And I said, sir, um, you know, if you're going to say something like that to me, I will respond. I said, you know, you're going to be standing before the Lord very soon. And he gives you the breath that allows you to breathe right now. Do you really want to continue to go on boasting like that? And... Um, you would think the man would get angry at me, maybe. I mean, it, did, it fueled his flame, you know. The man w went on and on. Those are obvious forms of pride. Uh, but then pride is manifest in more subtle ways. I, I, I thought of social media as a, a, a primary way in our day that, uh, that man contends for God's supremacy. That's what pride is. Um. And I know there's a lot of innocent interactions uh, online and on social media platforms, but there's also those, uh, those hidden intentions of the heart that come out with a post about your beauty or your possessions or your accomplishments or your job and all these little things that may seem very innocent on the surface and we're scrolling through, but the heart motive behind that uh, was quite arrogant. And the Lord knows and sees that. And uh, before we judge King Nebuchadnezzar too harshly for walking out on his balcony and boasting of his kingdom and all that he accomplished, uh, we should pause and ask the Lord to reveal if even the root of that is in our own hearts. Uh, Jonathan Edwards said, pride is much more difficult to be discerned than any other corruption because of its very nature. Pride is a person having too high of an opinion of himself. Is it any surprise then that a person who has too high an opinion of himself is unaware of it? His thinking is that he thinks that his opinion of himself is right. Therefore, it is not too high. So that's how pride works. You, you think, well, I don't, I don't think I really have a pride problem. 
And that should tell you, you have a pride problem because you don't think you have a pride problem. C.S. Lewis said, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, or mere flea bites in comparison. It is through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. So it's that anti-God state of mind that caused Satan to rebel against God in heaven. It's the anti-God state of mind that caused Adam and Eve to commit the first sin. It's the anti-God state of mind that caused Nebuchadnezzar to build a 90-foot statue of himself and command everybody to bow down to it. Pride isn't just a, a, you know, a high self-esteem. It is that. But pride is contending for the supremacy of God. It, it, it's saying, uh, God is not worthy of all worship. I deserve some too. That's pride. And that's why James 4.6 says that God opposes the proud. Opposes. That's an active present tense verb, meaning it's constant and ongoing opposition to those who remain in pride, but he does what to the humble? Gives grace to the humble. Luke 14.11, Jesus promised everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And then Proverbs promises that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's not just a possibility. That is a promise. And, and I don't know a, a story that better illustrates that than this one right here. The, this King Nebuchadnezzar going from the most powerful, influential, popular ruler in the ancient world to a beast crawling on all fours, eating grass for seven years, is a pretty vivid illustration of God humbling a man. And, and think of the context, right? This is happening in uh, Babylon, the city of Babylon. Remember that city? Showed up early on in Scripture, Genesis 11. It was called Babel at that time. That God had to humble the whole city because of their pride trying to build a tower to reach to the heavens. You know, it's a. Uh, you say, well, why is it even prideful to try to build a tall tower? Well, because God, before that, had told them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with his image. But what do they do? They huddle up in one city and seek to build a tower to heaven to do something godlike in their image. And what, it's, it's funny in that passage in, in uh, Genesis 11, there's a little irony there because it says that God had to come down to see the tower that they made. So it's like they, it, there probably was a tall tower, but, but God had to come down to, to see it. He couldn't even see it from heaven, which we know is not literal, but it's a, it's a mockery. It's an anthropomorphism to say, uh, your, your tower is not impressive, and I will mock your attempts to be like me. And it's interesting that there's irony in this story, that God is mocking this proud king who makes an image. The chapter before this, he's making an image of himself, 90 feet tall, commanding everybody to bow down to it. And God says, oh, you want to be like me? You'll become a beast of the ground. And you'll leave the palace. And I'll humble you to the dirt. And it's a mockery. It's a mockery. In both these stories, they're saying it, the same thing as that passage we read last week in Psalms chapter 2 that says, the nations rage against the Son of God. And then it says, he who is in heaven laughs. He laughs at their attempts to rage against his Son enthroned in heaven. It's like, it's like God saying, you know who's not going to be laughing 
on the last day, anyone who stiffens their neck against me. Anybody who won't humble themselves before me, that person won't be laughing. The joke will not be on me, says the Lord. It is a mockery that for anyone who would oppose him and remain prideful. And, you know, it, it is sad, this, this passage, a lot of the secular scholars do laugh at this story. Um, they don't believe it happened, uh, like many stories in the Old Testament. But they're ignoring at least one basic literary fact here that this chapter, chapter 4, is, a, is a King Nebuchadnezzar's own testimony. And why would a king this arrogant and prideful tell a story that humiliates him like this? I mean, this has got to be the most embarrassing moment of his life. I don't know about you. I don't see too many arrogant, extremely narcissistic, arrogant people out there telling stories that make themselves look terrible and then exalting God to the highest place. Now, I tend to believe a man and think he's being honest if he isn't the hero of his own story and he only tells one story and he's not the hero and God is, I tend to, to believe that person. So let's look at this starting in verse 1. I'm going to read a few portions of this to us. First few verses here. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders the Most High God has done for me. How great are His signs! How mighty His works! His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and His dominion endures from generation to generation. So this is a man who has been brought down and he's now calling God the Most High. Not an accident. Verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. So life is easy for him until, what? The dream. This is the, this is the moment of personal crisis for him. We all have those, right? The moment of personal crisis and how we respond and handle those reveals either our pride or humility. So he says in verse 5, I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in the bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me and that they should make known to me the interpretation of the dream. The magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers came in and I told them the dream, but they could not make it known to me its interpretation. At last, once they had all had their shot, at last, finally, into the line, Daniel came in before me. So here's the first thing that we see here. Prideful people are always willing to hear someone else before they will hear God. Always. Nebuchadnezzar had just seen Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace not getting burned alive. And he praises it. He's like, that's amazing. This God is the God of all gods. But then what does he do? He goes right back to all the, the cultural icons, the different uh, ways, the, the different people that would have been trustworthy in that culture and disregards the word of God and leaves Daniel to the end of the list. This is uh, common in the church today. You know, God has given us here a sufficient word. Sufficient. Meaning it's, uh, it has everything we need for life and godliness. Everything we need for life and godliness. Now, that doesn't mean, when we say sufficiency of Scripture, let me, side note, uh, that doesn't mean that um, it's going to tell you how to fix your car engine, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that the Bible is sufficient to tell us, like when Noah was having pain in his side the other day, we didn't open the Bible and go, okay, what do we do about that? You know, we call the doctor. Uh, yesterday, we're, me and Priscilla are at the gym, and she's watching, uh, I'm like, what are you listening to? She's watching a lecture about ADHD, all right, for one of our kids. And so the Bible doesn't speak to every issue. 
There, there's, that's not what it means by sufficient. But countless issues it does speak to. Thousands of interpersonal issues, gender issues regarding marriage, uh, raising children, education and discipline of children, work issues, stress, anxiety, worry, depression, anger, bitterness, fear, lust, sexual issues. Basically anything that people typically go to a counselor, a therapist, a psychologist for, the Bible actually speaks to. That's interesting. King Nebuchadnezzar didn't first go to God's wisdom in his moment of crisis. King Nebuchadnezzar trusted first in the culture's secular psychology of that day. Now, i got to play the devil's advocate here. I know some of y'all are thinking, okay, pastor, are you saying that a, a secular family therapist is the same as a pagan Babylonian witchcraft? Are you putting those, are you saying these are the same? Um, at, at one level, no. At another level, yes. Because at their root, they are atheistic ideologies that remove God's word from the equation on issues that he speaks directly to. So it's not humility when God says, I, I will tell you about your marriage. I will tell you about your kids. I will tell you about your addiction. I will tell you about this problem. And you go, I don't, I've already read that before. That is irrelevant. I want to hear what the world says. That's a problem. That's not humility. And you say, pastor, are you saying that secular counselors can't help us? It depends what we mean by help. It depends what we mean by help. If we mean by help, can they help you stop being anxious? Yes. Uh, if we mean by help, can they help you get along better with your spouse or control your temper? Yes. Um, but if we mean by help, can they help you find true joy, true freedom, true life, true godliness? Live a life that pleases the Lord. They're not, they don't even claim to do that. Romans 15, 13 says, Our God is a God who can fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. That's so far superior than even the best claims of what the world could offer you. And it's tragic, you know, like uh, the, the, the counseling ministry um, up in Indiana that for six years, the biblical counseling uh, training center that I was trained under, uh, they have a huge ministry there. It's a, it's a very large church, but they have a hundred person waiting list at all times in their community because they offer free counseling for people to come in and get counseling. And they have like a hundred trained counselors that meet in the church with people throughout the week. It's a very awesome ministry and helps a lot of people. But, the, but it, it's interesting that that 100-person waiting list, once they begin to, to get to meet with these people and they ask them, okay, what kind of help have you received so far? They're like, well, we've been to this counselor and this therapist and this psychologist and this uh, medicine I've taken and, and basically felt like we should just see what God has to say about it. Last resort. We've tried everything that the world has to offer. Maybe, maybe we're willing to sit down and hear what God says. That's King Nebuchadnezzar. He listens to everything the culture has. Everything the world can give him, he gets nowhere and he goes, okay, Daniel, your turn. And I, I, I know some of you are thinking, Pastor, I don't, I don't quite see the, the parallel between counseling and interpreting an ancient dream. And I would say, yes, but look at the issue. I mean, if you set King Nebuchadnezzar before a board-certified clinical psychologist, how would they diagnose this man? According to the DSM manual, the official manual, he would be, at the very least, schizophrenic, clearly narcissistic. Narcissism you know, came from Greek mythology. Gee, the guy that was so obsessed with his own image, he would look in the mirror. 
By the way, uh, most celebrity relationships don't end. I found this yesterday researching this because, you know, not because of job conflicts or uh, money, but they, they said dual narcissism. <laughs> so this king is narcissistic. He built a 90-foot statue of himself and commanded everybody to bow to it. <laughs> If that's not a man full of himself, I, I don't know. And then, and then at the sound of any music, they had to bow. Or they'd be burned alive. That's psychotic. That's psychotic. We lock people up for less than that. He had the furnace turned up seven times of the heat. It burned all his men. And he had no remorse for killing his own men. That's called psychotic. I looked it up yesterday in a medical journal and it said psychotic behavior is a personality disorder characterized by a lack of empathy and remorse. So if that is a thing, this guy has it. And uh, I also found yesterday that in 2008, there was apparently an online petition to remove President Trump from office because of a personality disorder similar to this, uh, signed by 70,000 mental health professionals. 70,000. Uh, most recently, a Washington, D.C.-based psychologist, Vince Greenwood, wrote a long paper where he laid out a detailed case that Trump, President Trump was a psychopath. Why do I bring that up? Because if he's getting that label, President Trump, clearly the man who builds a 90-foot statue and commands everyone to bow at the sound of or else you die, gets that label. Scripture deals heavily with what we would call personality dis disorders or chemical imbalances. Many of the prophets... Many of the, the, the psalmists had battled depression. They give guidance how to overcome it. The Apostle Paul has been called by, I've heard a few people call him bipolar because he has these extreme highs and extreme lows. And it's, it's like he has no mid-ground emotion. You look at Samson. He seemed to, to have some sort of sexual addiction that he didn't ever really seem to get over. You look at Abraham, he has classic signs of anxiety and worry that seem to be habitual. Moses had anger problems. We could go on and on and on and outlay all these people. And here's the point. Could medicine have helped them? Sure, maybe, I don't know. But what all of them needed more than anything was to hear what God said about them and to receive grace from God. Nebuchadnezzar's greatest need, even if he had personality disorders or chemical imbalance, was God's word accurately given to him. And in that regard, Daniel is a good biblical counselor. And this is what he says to him, picking up in verse 20. The tree you saw grew. It became strong so that its top reached the heaven. It was visible to the ends of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and fruit abundant and in which was food for all, under which beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of heavens lived. It is you, O king, that's who the tree is, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reached the heavens, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven, saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump in its roots to the earth, bound with the bound with the band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of the field and let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over. It probably means seven years. Uh, this is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the King that you shall be given from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven for seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know 
that heaven rules. And then listen to verse 27. It's a a call to repentance. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness. You say, what does repentance look like? Practice righteousness. And your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. And because God's word never returns void, and if he says he'll humble you, he'll humble you. Verse 29 says at the end of 12 months, after a year, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace in Babylon. And the king said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built with my mighty power and royal residence for the glory of my majesty. And while the words were in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. For seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom He will. Immediately, the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox and his body was wet with dew of heaven till his hair grew long and an eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. So you have this king, the strongest, most powerful, influential man in the world at that time. God confirms his word to him and does what he said. He becomes a beast. His fingernails grow long. His hair grows long. He, he, he is no longer in his kingdom, in his palace. He's out in the, the fields eating grass for seven years. And people debate, did he literally turn into an animal? The text says for seven seasons, or uh, I think that's years, He's on all fours acting like one, eating grass like one, long claws like an animal. He can't think rationally. Verse 16 is helpful. It says a beast's mind will be given to him. So I don't think he actually became an animal. I think he's acting like an animal. And even mentally, his mind is like a beast. It's irrational. And it makes you think of uh, Romans chapter 1 where God's judgment comes on those who are arrogant, so arrogant that they would worship the creature rather than the creator. And God says, it says he gives them up to a what? A debased mind for for the arrogance of worshiping a creature over the creator. Sin makes us irrational. Pride is animalistic and unreasonable. It doesn't make sense. Pride pride is less than human. Pride is the opposite of enlightened and progressive. It's primitive and uncivilized. It's it's not rationality that causes someone to support uh, support abortion, the, the killing of your own child. I had hamsters growing up that did that with their babies. Okay, that's animalistic. It's irrational. It's uncivilized. It's barbaric. That's what pride does. That's what sin does. I I was watching a documentary last night with the with my family, and uh, it made me think about kind of the the symbolism and and biblical imagery that's going on here. Uh, This documentary had a portion was talking about evolution. And, um, you know, I thought about how evolution claims that we're we're all basically just beasts, just more evolved beasts or less evolved beasts, but we're all just beasts. And it's just so uh, not scientific. There's no scientific proof to that. That's uh, an assumption uh, based off of atheism that says there is no God. And you think of, and it's a sad worldview because you think, think of how nuanced and beautiful the Christian worldview is how, and, and how it describes a living being. You have God existing eternally 
and he creates man in his image. So God, man, and then you have under man, God creates animals. And they're not man and they're not God, but they're less than God and man. And then you have this other living being, an angel. And so you have these four different beings, God, man, made in God's image, beasts, and angels. And I, and I was thinking about this passage, how Satan, uh, or I was thinking about how Satan, he's, a, he's an angel in heaven, and then because of pride, God sends him down to earth as a what? A beast. He, he, he's, he's a serpent. He, he's a lion. He's a, uh, a dragon at times. He's a leviathan, a, a prehistoric alligator type creature. Maybe about 40 feet long, this terrifying creature. So pride took an angel and turned him into a beast. And that imagery is interesting that you take this king who is a man made in God's image but wants to be worshipped as God and God humbles him and brings him down to the earth at the lowest point, the point of a beast. It's, it's an ultimate form of humbling. It's a vivid illustration of God's ability to humble the proud. And I think it, it, it really presses this question on all of us. You know, the, que- the question isn't if we will be humbled by God. The, the question is when we will be humbled by God. We will all be humbled by God. The question is, will it be in this life or in the next? Philippians 2 says, every knee will bow. You will acknowledge that the Most High rules the kingdom of men. You'll do it now or you'll do it later. You are not the master of your own destiny. You are not completely autonomous to live however you want and have no consequences. We will all eventually bow, either now or later. And that's a warning. And preachers give warnings like this. And you read the Bible and you hear this warning, and it's tragic that many people ignore the warning and don't repent. And that's what happens to King Nebuchadnezzar's son in chapter 5. He gets the warning over and over and says, your dad turned into a beast, man. He heard it over and over and over again. He knew. And in chapter 5, listen to this, verse 22 of chapter 5. You, his son, Daniel goes to him. You, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house, you have been brought before you, and your lords and wives and concubines have drank wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose all your ways you have not honored. Year after year after year, this king heard, humble yourself like your dad. You saw what happened to your dad. And he didn't do it. And the night that Daniel said that to him, that man died. He died. You know, they said about the Titanic, even God couldn't sink it. Listen, God can sink your ship. And if he does, and you're still alive, that's the grace of God. Because this man's son, King Nebuchadnezzar's son, heard the warning over and over and over again, did nothing and died. But King Nebuchadnezzar heard the warnings, and then God humbled him, but then raised him up. And that's grace. That's grace. When he was raised up, it says his mind was restored to him 
And two things happened at that point. He knew God is glorious and I am a beast. And when God clears up your mind, when you've been humbled and God clears up your mind, those two things are clear. God is glorious. I'm not. And listen to David, uh, King David, Psalm 73, 22. He says, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. That's what he says to God. I was like a beast toward you, God. And then verse 23, but you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Guys, have you, who is not thankful for the Lord humbling you like that? What a grace to realize who God is and to see yourself for who you really are, not your puffed up inflated version of yourself. What a grace. You know, maybe one, qual- one thing to point out here, uh, you could, somebody could read this and go, well, the reason why he repented, this king, is because he had to hit rock bottom. I don't think so. People don't repent just because they have to hit rock bottom first. That's not a biblical concept. This man hit rock bottom and was on the rock bottom for seven years. <laughs> he lived for seven years on rock bottom. God raised him up and brought sense back to him. And when God did, he didn't dare steal the glory from God. He gave all glory and praise to God who deserved it. Let me end with this question. How do you know that that grace to be humbled by God, to to see yourself rightly, to see God for who He is. How do you know that's happened to you? And I would say, you need to check on two things. You need to check on what is your view of God and what is your view of yourself? Because you know someone has come back to their senses when they are, their view of God is leading to this uh, This view of God as supreme and sovereign. That person is seeing God accurately. You know, it's interesting. People in our circles, they will accuse us sometimes of overvaluing, overemphasizing God's sovereignty. But it's interesting that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, as he comes back to his senses, that's the first thing he wants to talk about is the sovereignty of God. He says in verse 34, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever for His dominion is everlasting dominion and His kingdom endures from generation to generation and all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and He does according to His will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? This king didn't walk into a a church service like this and feel the peer pressure. Uh, Everybody's singing. I guess I should sing so I don't look like I'm... I don't care. This man saw God clear enough You couldn't stop him from singing. He started the chapter, hymn of praise to God. He ends the chapter, hymn of praise to God. No glory to self. The part he told about himself is the embarrassing part. That's a man who's begun to see clearly. And this is how he exits the scene. We never hear in Scripture from this man again. Here's his last words. Verse 37, I now, King Nebuchadnezzar, praise, extol, and honor the King of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. 
Do you believe him? This pagan king? He's a Gentile. I didn't think Gentiles got saved. (laughs) This man got saved. It's rare. It happens in the Old Testament. Do you believe God is able to humble? This man went from commanding all nations to bow down and worship his image to then one chapter later saying all people's nations and languages there is a God in heaven and he alone is worthy of your worship. And he is a God who is able to humble and show you that reality. Let's pray, church. Father, Father, what weighty realities, Lord. Lord, we spend our week thinking so often of such small things in comparison to these type things. So Lord, help us not to live in the the small temporary and ignore the eternal. Lord, we pray that this message from this chapter would break through in our lives in whatever way we need it to. We pray, Holy Spirit, that You would work. Bring change in us. In me, as I've studied this this week, thank You for how You've used this in my heart. And I pray, Father, for those who've just thought through what Your Word has said. Use this in their lives so that you get more glory and they get more joy. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.